Assalamualaikum and a very good morning. I bid to our respected director, Sheikh Romaino bin Rabu, director of, director of IPG Campus Pendidikan Technik. I would also like to welcome our esteemed panelists from Brisbane, Australia, Dr. Sofian Subahan, learning and teaching consultant curriculum from the Griffith University of Australia, and Dr. Marlina Abdurrahman. She is a general practitioner who is also the ex-president of Parents and Citizen Association for Australian International Islamic College, Iraq for session 2021. Getting our honorable representatives from IPG Campus Pendidikan Technik, Ms. Alida Jasmine, Ms. Ainin Sofina, and finally, Mr. Daniel Hakim. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, Teaching and Learning Challenges During the COVID-19 Pandemic Using Past Experiences for Future Recommendations. Now, I am Wanis Kanda Zulkanain. I will be the moderator for today's uh, webinar. Now, before we begin our ceremony, I would like to invite Ali Iman bin Mazlan to lead us for our dua recitation to, the, to garner the blessings of the Almighty. Thank you, Iskanda, our moderator for today. Um, Assalamualaikum and good morning to all of you. So I will begin our prayer recitation. A'uz billahi minashaytanir rajim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursalin. Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Allahumma ya Allah, ya Rahman, ya Rahim. On this blessed morning, in conjunction with the webinar, Teaching and Learning Challenges During the COVID-19 Pandemic, we beseech thee and are grateful towards you in favour of all infinite blessing to us, your humble servant, to live a safe and prosperous life. May our live webinar, in collaboration with Griffith University of Australia, Australian International Islamic College, and Institute of Technical Teachers Education, we seek your blessing for the flawless progress of this event from the beginning till the end. We seek your guidance to steer clear of events that would be detrimental to the progress of this event. Allah, ya latif, ya karim, please bless us with your tawfiq and hidayah. Please guide us to greatness, peace, glory, and prosperity in this world and the hereafter. May us responsible and intellectual human beings grant us with a valuable knowledge that will be beneficial to mankind in order to your mardatillah. May us, your righteous servant, that follow your commands and neglect sinful acts. Please forgive us for our wrongdoing. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Ameen, ameen, ya rabbal alameen. Thank you very much to Ali Iman for leading our prayer recitation. Before we begin our discussion, let us watch short montages from the Griffith University of Australia and also IPG KBT. When you go to Griffith University, it's about more than making it. It's about making it matter. Because protecting this matters. Healthy kids matter. Pushing what's possible matters. For me, it's about doing something that I love. If you want to be part of a brighter future, don't just make it, make it matter.
All right. Now it is time for us to hear a speech from director of IPG KPT and Sheikh Romaino bin Rabu. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. Thank you to the master of ceremony. Alhamdulillah. Please to be God for with his permission and grace we can gather for today's webinar. Firstly, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the language departments under the leadership of one Azrina Yaakob as the head of the department, language department lecturers one Rosil Amiza Shamsir and Madam Evelyn Gunnam William George for successfully organizing an event of this scale. I would like also to earthly congratulate the committee members of this webinar for accepting the challenge of conducting a program at an international level. They have worked hard to ensure that this program will be success until the end event. All right. Thank you very much to our respected director, Sheikh Romaino bin Rabu, for the wonderful speech to officiate today's webinar. Now, without further ado, let us begin our webinar with a brief introduction uh, by each panelist. I believe we are all very curious about each other. Therefore, I would like to invite Dr. Sofian Subahan to briefly introduce himself. Salam semua. Um, terima kasih kerana sudi mengundang saya um, di dalam webinar ini. So that's as far as my Malay can go. Uh, <laughs> uh, saya boleh berbahasa Melayu tetapi it's a, a little bit awkward, right? Um, so I'm Sofian Suban and I'm a learning and teaching consultant curriculum at uh, the Griffith University at Griffith University in Brisbane, Australia, and I work within the group of arts, education and law. Um, so I support my colleagues in uh, developing uh, their courses, particularly focusing on the course design uh, considerations of curriculum. Um, assessment items, um, and currently we're working, we're working towards more meaningful feedback when we do uh, we give feedback to our students in relation to their assignment items. Um, and also there's this big focus uh, in terms of engagement, engagement with students, particularly in the spaces that we are, that we are working with around COVID-19 and some of the limitations that we have experienced so far. Um, so I started working um, as a learning and teaching consultant a few months before the onset of COVID-19. So I have had first-hand experience in uh, supporting my colleagues to, uh, how do I say, transition from their familiar teaching spaces, teaching and learning spaces, and the way they deliver their content to a more unfamiliar space. And here we're talking about uh, remote learning and teaching. Um, prior to uh, becoming a learning and teaching consultant, so I have had um, experience in uh, um, in learning uh, in lecturing uh, within the TESOL programs, TESOL program at the university, and also in courses that are related to linguistics and sociolinguistics, um, and I have been doing that for close to fifteen years. Prior to that, I was like some of you here or most of you here i was an english language teacher um but back in singapore um so th that is my and then my academic interests or my research interests are in the areas of language culture and identity um an extension to this experience that i have in the topic that we're talking about today i'm also um i was also involved in home-based learning and i'm 
probably Marlena would also experience this when our, our, uh, our children's schools are closed. And then we as parents, uh, we have to work from home. And at the same time, also, we have to teach our students um, uh, as guided by the school. So I have first an experience um, and I would like to share a little bit about that later too. Thank you, Aniskanda. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Doctor. Now uh, we shall proceed with uh, Dr. Marlina, if you please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wan Iskandar, Mr. Moderator. Uh, so, um, Assalamualaikum and hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Marlina Abdurrahman. Uh, I've been in Australia for about 19 years. Um, so, I, I came in 2004 to study at uh, the University of Melbourne um, to study medicine uh, for six years and graduated in 2009. Um, I then worked uh, as a doctor and have been working as a doctor for about 11 years and um, did my uh, specialty training in general practice and I've been a GP for about eight years. Um, so Alhamdulillah, uh, uh, I've had a bit of experience working in Australia um, and I'm also a mother to four children. So my kids are age uh, 12, 10, 7 and 2. So um, I've had a bit of uh, yeah, experience with home-based learning um, as well. So, uh, inshallah, I'll, I'll be sharing a bit about that. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, finally, let us hear an introduction from the representatives of IPG KPT. Uh, we'll begin with uh, Ms. Alida, if you may. Um. Assalamualaikum to everyone. Okay. Uh, my name is Elida Jasmine, and you can call me Eli. And I am from Institution Teacher Training in Milai, and I am currently on my second year of degree in Kaso. Uh, a brief uh, introductory of myself, I am the youngest daughter of my family, and my family is basically um, uh, based with educators, with my father and my sisters are both educators. So today I would like to, I am, I am honored to be able to share and listen to all the information that we are going to be sharing in the session. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Alida. Now, how about you, uh, Ms. Ainin? Uh, hi, Assalamualaikum, everyone. Uh, so my name is Ainin Sofina. You can address me as Ainin. And just like Alida, I am currently in my second uh, year degree in TESO, and uh, we will be posted to uh, primary schools after our degree. and. Uh, a brief introduction about myself. Uh, both my parents are education based because my, both my parents were both teachers. So, and I have younger siblings. I am the eldest in the family and have younger siblings. So, um, I have a little bit of experience about uh, home based learning, sharing you know, challenges with my siblings as well. So, I am glad to be here today to share that experience with everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to Ms. Uh, Ainin. Now, finally, our last panelist, uh, Mr. Daniel. Uh, can you briefly introduce yourself? Okay. Uh, Assalamualaikum and a very good morning. I wish you all of you. Okay. Uh, my name is Daniel Hakim Bim Hawak Nizam. And uh, same, same as uh, Elida Jasmine and Ainin. I'm also in my second year of uh, learning in Tessel. Uh, my course is Tessel. So, yeah, uh, I'm really glad to be here to share my experience with uh, all of you. And I would love to learn more uh, in this webinar. And uh, I'm really uh, appreciate uh, for this webinar. I think that's all from me. All right, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Daniel, and also all of our panelists for the brief introduction. Now, to begin, I believe the pandemic has introduced us to an environment never seen before. You know, although the world has experienced many pandemics before, one thing that sets COVID apart from the rest is how it has changed the landscape of many global sectors, primarily education. 
And in my opinion, COVID was like a spark that actually jump-started our community to fully integrate ICT into the field of education. But it did come with its own sets of issues as with any things that happened too suddenly. Now, therefore, I think each of our panelists have come to face challenges of their own because of COVID. Hence, it would be wonderful for us to hear the challenges faced by each panelist. We shall begin with Dr. Sofian, a representative from the Griffith University, to share the challenges that he has faced due to the pandemic. Please do, Dr. Thank you so much, Wan Iskandar. So I, I think you're right. You're definitely right to say that COVID-19 has in fact presented us with particular challenges. Um, and I'm going to um, share with you some of the issues that we experience within the higher education um, setting. And at the same time, also myself as a parent who has had to uh, conduct work, uh, sorry, um, home-based learning for my two sons. One is in primary school and one is, is in secondary school. So what I, do, what I did notice coming into the space, coming into the COVID-19 space sometime around two, two and a half years ago when my university had to close, um, there was this particular panic um, in terms of what do we do because we are no longer able to teach within the familiar face-to-face -face synchronous environment. And then there's this need to actually still continue with business as usual. The business as usual is essentially teaching students in a university setting. Now, there have been a lot of affordances over time, obviously, right? Because we are quite familiar in terms of using technology to teach and learn. However, COVID-19 has in fact presented a more, how do I say, heightened uh, need to think about how do I teach within a space where I can actually meet my students um, face to face. So during that particular period, I was supporting my academics to move from things that they were familiar and things that they are not. Now I call these particular periods as transitions, so transition periods, all right? So at that particular stage, it was an emergency transition, the need to quickly move to do remote delivery. Remote as in a sense where we're not teaching in the space that we're familiar with and not in the university setting either, all right? So this is where it becomes challenging. It has become challenging for particular academics who are not necessarily technologically savvy. I think we need to understand that as much as we assume that people can use technology at this time, okay, there's a difference in terms of using technology to teach, people actually having a good understanding of how to use technology and whether that particular individual is able to quickly upskill themselves to use technology. So these are three of the main challenges that I think, um, or that I observed that my academics face when they had to move from um, what they are familiar with. So they have to transition to remote uh, learning. Um, one of the things that we need to acknowledge at the same time is that we do, we transition all the time. For example, a, you transition from high school to uh, university. You transition from a workplace, from one workplace to another. So transitions happen all the time. And COVID-19 has in fact given us this understanding that life is about transitions. It's about how you understand that you do need to transition, how you give time to transition, you know, um, and how you manage those transitions over time. One thing that I would like to also acknowledge is that when we had to move, when we had to transition from what we're familiar with, um, teaching in the face-to-face -face synchronous environment to remote learning, there's there's this sense of panic, right? Or there's this sense of chaos. Uh, in fact, there is a, a, a lot of literature on what uh, academics call a period of panic pedagogy, whereby they do things because they panic and there's not a lot of, how do I say, thought that has went into designing particular, particular delivery and pedagogy and, and assessment items and things like that. So panic pedagogy is something that developed during the onset of COVID-19. But we would assume that by this time, yeah, by this time it's been two and a half years, this particular transition has somewhat eased and we are moving towards a particular space where we are doing more meaningful things. We are no longer panicking. 
But to some people, they're still panicking because they're constantly in flux. They're constantly moving from one transition to another and not giving themselves enough space to think, am I doing this right? Am I doing this meaningfully? And then there are others, other academics who are thriving, or doing so well, embracing the changes that they are currently facing and, ch uh, and challenges that are, are moving forward. So that's within the higher education context. As a parent, when I had to work from home, actually I, I'm, I'm very okay with regards to working from home because I have the technology, right? So I, as you mentioned it just now, when Iskandar, technology has facilitated a way that we can work from home, right? Like what we are doing right now, we're doing remote webinar and it's, it's commonplace right now. But the issue was that I also had my two boys at home, all right? And their teachers, had to, how do I say, create lessons that they would have, they would probably, they would have conducted in class, but now I have to conduct it at home. Now, there was a lot of learning, I think, and, and I, I, probably Marlena can also uh, um, uh, contribute a little bit later, being uh, really involved uh, within your college itself, right? So I had my son's teachers sending me loads of work for my for my sons to do at home as a teacher myself uh from previously i i understand this is too much work but because the teachers in those schools were also still learning what's happening they are panicking they're trying to make sense okay this is what i deliver in class and how do i do it uh, uh, as 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 something is just remote and something that parents can manage at home but often we also forget that parents at home also need to work. Parents at home also need other, uh, have other obligations. And students at home, they don't really function the same way as they would at school, right? At school, they have at 45 minutes, they have this class, then they go for their first break, and then they have games, and then they connect with their friends. We don't have that kind of, how do I say, uh, uh, systems in the home itself. So as much as I was helping my academics to transition from remote learning as from uh, what they're familiar with to something that they need to embrace, I was also doing the same. And the teachers, my, my, my children's teachers are also doing the same. So everyone is trying to transition from what they're familiar with to something new. So when COVID-19 um, struck us, okay, there are particular challenges and I see those challenges either slowly becoming less challenging, but I also feel that there are spaces where there's a lot of ways that we can improve upon. Thank you, Wan Iskandar. Uh, sorry. So yeah, I believe that the whole gist of uh, the thing with COVID is it involves a lot of adaptation, you know, the so-called transition. Uh, and, and as human, we have been adapting a lot. You know, we used to kill birds with stones. Now we have guns. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we do that all the time, uh, right? Yeah. With, um, any you know sector, even uh, with you know education. And the thing about COVID is it diminishes the barrier, like you said before. You know, like you uh, as a parent. You are also a worker at home, so being a parent and also a professional at home uh, can be uh, really difficult. You know, it takes time for us to get used to that uh, process. And at the end of the day, I think everyone was simply struggling uh, with the, you know, with the transition. You know, trying to ease ourselves with the process of transitioning. But now I think we're doing a lot better than before because so far it's been close to three years. And I think by next year, we would already uh, master, you know, this whole ordeal with uh, home-based learning and non-face-to-face -face learning and all. And I think, I also believe that some of us might actually perform better in this sort of space uh, compared to, uh, you know, like actual uh, physical interaction. Because like you said before, when we are performing presentations online or webinar online, we can have all the notes right in front of us. But if this were to be conducted face-to-face, it would, <laughs> it would be pretty difficult for us to have, you know, notes right in front of us and stuff like that. Uh, but anyway, uh, let's hear, uh, you know, Miss Alida, you know, challenges 
uh, as a student in this uh, sort of environment, we heard from Dr. Uh, Sofyan previously, you know, challenges as a parent and also as an educator. Now let's hear from Alida, who's also not only a student, but will also be an educator soon. Okay, uh, thank you, Iskanda. Okay, um, as Dr. has mentioned, Dr. Sofyan has mentioned before about we. I got to agree when we said that everyone is transitioning and they have to adapt and this is actually a challenge for all of us. Not just in the educator sec uh, education sectors but in all other sectors. But what I have to agree so much when you said about um, when we are transitioning from the traditional classroom into the pan pandemic phase in which we are required to do online learning, um, it is a problem when we all have to use the technology. Because people... It is very easily said that as younger generations like us, we are no, we are more driven, more expert in using technology. But it, that's not necessarily true because if I'm being honest, I am no technology savvy. I have, I am, I struggle myself, but especially when the pandemic started. As you mentioned, also it's different when we know how to use technology, but it's also another another level when we have. Entirely depends on it, especially when we are to do business, when we are to educate or learn. And this is, I feel like, this is very much related to um, as to learn. When we have to transition, uh, uh, because we know that changes, transitioning, it does not happen overnight. It would take time. It changes. Um, it would happen progressively. So when we are forced to, like, jump right into into the pandemic stage and that we have to do like everything and as you mentioned in the panic pedagog pedagogy when you don't have the teachers educators don't have the time to actually plan carefully but we just have to act, act on because we are this factor we have to work so it actually becomes chaotic as you mentioned it before and it because when that happened it actually increases a lot of stress whether it's physical emotional or mental stress and especially when we are at home, when we are doing online teaching and learning, we don't have like one role only like you mentioned before, because as you said, you, as, you are also a teacher, but also a parent. And as a student myself, I am also a daughter because we have other obligations. Because it differs compared to you, the stress level increases because um, it differs when we are in institutions or academic sector, like as students we are, when we are, when I am in my institute, I am obligated to learn only. I don't have to do other works. And the same things as teachers, I know that now that 21st century, it doesn't only revolve around teaching, or, but the soul, the baseline of it is we are to teach and we are to learn. But it makes it like increase the um, emotional and stress in all level. And in that sense, it also makes us as students, or even I say, I say as educators, we're feeling burnt out because we are overwhelmed with our works. And especially when the differences, as we can see in face-to-face -face class in the online classes, is when the scheduling itself. Let's say in face-to-face -face class, we have like a strict schedule. Like let's say this class starts at 8 and to, it ends like 5 p.m. And along that time, the span of time we have, the time allocated, we would have to um, finish the works. At the sole time itself, we will have to do uh, where the working, where the teaching, and all the learning. But when it comes to online classes, we know that people always say that some people have this assumption that online classes are easy because it has flexibility to it. I The flexibility, it's okay, but sometimes it's a major problem sometimes because what I'm talking about, because we feel like, okay, this is flexible, but... It sometimes takes other time as well. We have to do overwork and then it takes times of our resting time and it makes us feel like, um, usually feel very sluggish, fatigued because we all feel like oh, so many works to do because like uh, doctor has mentioned before, like teachers are, teachers are also transitioning so they give lots of work because they want to, the students to catch up on the syllabus but they don't know how. So that's exactly what. So when that happens, students are feeling overwhelmed as well. So when that, and it's just not only in that sense, and when that happens, when we are overwhelmed with what students are being like mentally, emotionally, intellectual exhausted. It's sometimes, if I'm being honest myself, when that happens, is even like smaller, like simple information, knowledge to, that is easy to get, like it's not like very complicated, it's even harder for me to get. 
I would feel like okay I don't know what is this why is it so hard for me to understand this anymore and then when that happened I feel that would lead me the burnt out itself when I'm feeling burnt out with everything I feel less motivated with studying I am the type to love to learn I know it sounds cliche a bit but it's true I love to learn but when this happened when I am feeling overwhelmed I am beginning to develop apathy towards learning Learning, studying feels like an obligation instead of a fun thing to do. So when I have assignments or I have tutorial tasks to do, instead of all studying or like focusing on the quality, I am just thinking, okay, I just want to get done with this. It's more like a bad email because I feel very tired and I feel like I don't get enough rest. And it feels like um, burnt out. I feel like in that sense, I have no, not only no motivations in studying but also in other things that I really enjoy to do like reading or something it's just like I feel tired all over over the time so this is what we call as burnt out in students I think so for me yes uh, <coughs> when you mentioned something about the you know like the burden that came with you know online learning and online uh, teaching I one thing that got into my mind was that you know previously uh, the time we take to stare at computers, uh, it didn't really feel as uh, you know, as straining as now. It's pretty weird that uh, 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 as the pandemic, you know, when it first started, <clears throat> sorry, when it first started, I was estranged by how tiring it was for me to be yeah. sitting in front of my computer. Even yeah. though previously, you know, I've been playing video games for like hours in front of my computer, but then it was like, okay, it's not as tiring as learning. And it, uh, the, at, at, I mean, it comes with its own sets of flexibility, of course, but the flexibility actually creates a new set of burden because I still remember when I was, you know, spending time with my family and all, I still have to keep tabs uh, mm -hmm. on the, you know, anything related to my studies because everything happens online. So if it happens physically, whatever's left at the office will stay at the office, okay? It will not come with me, uh, it will not come back with me uh, into my, you know, personal space. Uh, now, our personal space or resting space becomes a uh, stress generator space for some reason. <laughs> you are in your room, uh, you have, you know, you're trying to rest, but then at the same time, you know, work also happens here, everything happens here, and it becomes very, uh, you know, I guess the easiest, the easiest way to describe it is tiring. And yeah. it's even more tiring than actually spending time in physical classes from like 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. So, Dr. Yes, this is actually it's a good example. Um, one is kind of when you mention about um, that that what I'm observing right now, um, particularly when we do a lot of things online, is this blurring of work and life spaces. Uh, when we have not, how do I say, um, consolidated a lot of the things that we do um, prior to the pandemic and we are able to meet up people socially, we're able to travel to classes, you know, so it gives us some time such that we can move from one transition from one set of feelings or activities to another, right? So you, you drive to school or that kind of thing and then you can, you are ready for that particular space. But we also realize that because as much as um, technology has allowed us to connect in this space like that, so we are from Brisbane, we are in Brisbane and you are in Malaysia and we can, can connect in, at this particular time, it also creates this opportunity whereby it seems that people are mobile, right? That people can be at anywhere at any given time and you can connect with them because this technology. So I think what I'm experiencing right now is this idea that our, our workspaces, learning spaces, and personal spaces have merged. And what I notice also, for example, particularly working in the online space right now, that I have meetings after meetings. I do not know whether it's the same for you in terms of one class after another without actually having a, the, 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 the time yeah, to transition. No yeah. So again, this is where we need to think about our processes over time. You know, we need to give ourselves some time to think about what are we doing? Why are we doing things like this when it's not necessarily beneficial for us in terms of our socio-emotional and physical uh, well-being? 
I don't have a solution for that because that's how I work. You know, you have meetings after meetings, but it will, it will be something for us as teachers to consider how do we make this situation better? Because it is a common experience for, I mean, a leader was a leader mentioned that one is kind of mentioned this also. So it's not a unique experience, but it is a shared experience that probably, you know, as teachers and even as people, we can manage, hopefully, over time. Thank you. Yeah, it's a shared experience, uh, but we do have to come up with our own unique way to mitigate <laughs> the, the effects of our shared experience. So That's each right. one of us will have, you know, you know uh, unique Different ways, ways of yeah. trying to create that sense of gap between, you know, yeah. class, life, and work. Yeah. Uh, Just to share with you a little bit before, sorry, before we 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 can yeah. we continue. Um, I used to block in out one hour meetings, right? And then usually meetings will extend a little bit. So now I just do forty five minutes. And I try to keep at that 45 minutes because if I need to move to another meeting, I'll have 15 minutes to do something else, to clear my brain, to prepare stuff and things like that. Um, it is hard to, I'm saying it because it's aspirational. Aspirational means I plan to do it or intend to do it, but it doesn't really work all the time because I'm working with other people too. But I usually try to get a 40 minute, 45 minute um, session and give myself 15 minutes before I move on. So these are one of the, as you mentioned, unique ways in which we try to mediate, mediate our shared experience. That's a pretty good way uh, that we might actually have to incorporate into our, um, this whole thing with uh, online stuff. Uh, how about you, uh, Dr. Marina? What are uh, you know, some challenges that you have faced during the pandemic? Okay, thank you. Um, so I think Dr. Sofian has uh, also mentioned a bit about uh, a parent's perspective towards uh, learning from home or homeschooling. Um, so I do agree that uh, it's a challenge uh, for people who are working from home and at the same time having to um, teach their kids as well. Uh, so I'll be sharing in terms of my own experience and also other parents that I know of. Um, so as for me, Alhamdulillah, at the time I wasn't working from home because um, I just had a baby. So uh, my fourth child, she was only about maybe three months old um, at the time when there was lockdown and we had to do homeschooling. Um, I wasn't working and I think if I did work, it, was, it would be impossible with four children at home. So I would probably be, you know, taking leave or something like that. <laughs> um, so yeah, definitely challenging for people who work. Um, but as for me, I guess it was work as well because I had a little baby to look after um, and at the same time having to teach three children at three different levels. They were all in primary school but um, one in prep, one in year, I think he was my uh, prep year three and year five. So they all had different needs, different, you know, curriculums. Um, all of them have different learning styles as well. So. Um, I found, you know, uh, it was really challenging at the same time. It was um, quite enlightening because I, um, I somehow um, recognized my, my kids' different learning styles and then, you know, get, got to know them better actually um, and realized how different they all are and, you know, you can't just use one method to teach them. Um, so, yeah, that, that's when one of the challenges, just um, working from home. Um, and, yeah, different managing... Um, children if you have you know a few children at different levels um you have to yeah try to find the time to actually give your attention to each of the children um learning different things and you know them coming to you with different questions you know this and that so yeah that was quite yeah fun <laughs> um and um i guess for me it wasn't too bad as you know, I guess for my education level and my experience in the past, um, like teaching and learning is not that difficult, but um, it's definitely a challenge for parents who might not have, you know, um, the same education level um, or t parents who, um, who, don't, uh, who don't speak well in English or, you know, they don't actually understand English well. Um, at the school where my kids are, uh, there is a large number of uh, families who are uh, refugees, so their parents uh, probably, you know, uh, can't 
um, communicate or understand English much. So um, yeah, uh, I, I'm pretty sure there were many children uh, who were um, uh, who were not coping with their you know with their studies and the parents were not able to keep up with you know the, the lessons that the their teachers were giving. So um, yeah, definitely a challenge there. Um, plus you know parents don't have the same teaching background as teachers. You know they don't. Um, you know, they don't know how is, you know, how they have, you know, how they um, have to teach this in certain ways or what techniques they should use. So um, that's also, yeah, another challenge there. Um, and uh, um, I think most parents, Alhamdulillah at the time, we didn't have, uh, we didn't have a lockdown that was too long. I think it was about maybe three or, oh, hang on, two months. Dr. Sophia might remember, two months, yeah. Um, two months or and a bit, I think. So it wasn't as bad as I think in Malaysia. It went not for, went on for a bit longer. Um, but uh, during that, you know, two and a bit months, um, the the way like at at my kids' school, we were given like um, we were given um learning packages like for the week. So at the start of the week, we go and pick them up. So they like they distribute it to the parents. You know, we come in our car and they just pass it into the into the car to us. Um, for the week. Uh, and then uh, at the start of the next week, we submit the whole thing back to the school, something like that. Like, there are boxes there where you just, you know, leave your kids' work in there. Um, and every time I go and send my kids' work, there were only a few, like, a few folders in there. So, you know, um, it, it just shows that uh, many parents were not really, you know, able to keep up with the, you know, with teaching their kids and making sure they're completing their work, um, which is understandable. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. That's awesome. Hi, Marlena. Can I contribute a little bit? Um, sure. Um, in, in for my for my, for my children, children, I'm hearing um, echoes. Is that right? Okay. For for my for my children, uh, we were uh, all of the things were put online, so we have to access online, and then I actually had to share my home office with one of my boys who was in secondary school. Um, I understand that my English ability is fine enough to, you know, to resolve whatever homework that they need to do. And I've had teaching experience um, for, for many years, but I still couldn't necessarily coach him as effectively as I wanted to. So I was one of those parents, Marlena, who did not get their children to do their homework or do their uh, work and then submit to their teachers. So we did as much as we could because, uh, but I think the bigger issue for me, and I do not know whether you experienced the same, is the amount of work that was expected of the, stud of the student or children to complete at home, given the time that they do have at home and given the time that, that there isn't actually a, a school-like routine at home. So that was the issue for me, and progressively, um, we had had we have had a few other lockdowns, um, and then the the teachers in my in, in my son's schools realized, hey, we can do things differently and we can do things better. So when there was the second lockdown at home, okay, I was able to manage my uh, my 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 children's work they were able to manage their own work and we were able to actually submit good work all right so this 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 was a transition that the teachers and the schools had um obviously in the first instance the, lo the lockdown they were panicking and then over time they transitioned to a more comfortable space for themselves and also for their students and their impacts on us too as parents at home so that, that's that's the good thing that has evolved from the first lockdown to the subsequent lockdowns. Thank you. Uh, it was quite surprising to hear that Australia only had about two to three months of lockdown. <laughs> and also learning packages, that was something new in me. Uh, well, I guess the, the you know, the, the, when it comes to like parents and, you know, teaching children at home, I saw uh, you know, what the, the effects of you know, students being at home and in terms of their social cultural backgrounds, you know, their parents' occupation and all, it, great, it was greatly affected by COVID. Because uh, for example, like uh, in here in, in Malaysia, 
uh, I had the time to, uh, you know, I was given the opportunity to go to school uh, last uh, month. And the amounts of students that were simply, you know, they, they were left out by the whole situation. It was quite uh, 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 something that really uh, shows how badly affected they were because of the, you know, the social cultural background. Because I was uh, spending time at a pretty rural school, and I had the opportunity to observe year, I think it was year, yeah, year three students, but they were performing like a year two students. They lost at least a year of their education. And it's even worse because that so, uh, most of their parents, you know, they, they, they are not exactly uh, well educated. <clears throat> you know, most of them, they are, you know, working at you know, usual normal jobs. Uh, it's so much more different than when I was spending time at uh, pretty, uh, I guess the school was closer to the, uh, you know, like the urban parts of my state. And the differences in the, in the students is so vast that when I went to the rural school, the students were so quiet. Like it was as if like there were no students, but then the school were also pretty small. But that like when I sp had the time to go to the uh, urban part, like the school, it was uh, in the urban part of my state. Even though they were only like a, a year one, year two, and year three, oh my god, they were like so loud. You know, they were confident. They 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 were even though they they were not able to exactly speak English, they were confident enough to try it. And the thing is, the with when it comes to speaking English, it's mostly about confidence. You know, sometimes. Uh, People really don't care about uh, how good your grammar is when you're speaking. When you're speaking, of course, uh, it's a much more different uh, situation when you're writing because when you're writing, your whole message can be totally different because of your grammar. So yeah, but, but the thing with the uh, whole COVID, and it's pretty hard for these parents to uh, focus on educating their children because they still have to focus on, uh, you know, keeping food on the table. Because, uh, it's you know, COVID has affected not only our education but also the economy. And many people lost their jobs in many sectors, actually. And now, how about we hear challenges uh, from uh, Miss Ainin as uh, the uh, eldest? Uh, uh, thank you to uh, Iskandar. And sorry, is it echoing? Okay. Uh, is it better now? I'm sorry for the inconvenience. Okay, thank you to Iskanda. Um, so I would like to share my experience as uh, two roles in my life, which is as a sister, <clears throat> elder sister at home, and also as a student. So um, as Dr. Marina mentioned, uh, you shared a little bit about uh, your role as a parent and how uh, most parents struggle to help their children at home, right, to, to heal that that um, struggle, because both my parents are working, working parents, and uh, during the pandemic, they too work from home, but they are uh, busy with the you know meetings, and also I, as the elder sister, I have to take over and uh, help my siblings with their homework, with setting up their laptop, their phones. To, you know, to uh, get them into Google Meet to attend class. So I think that that's like one of the struggles that I had to face as a sister because um, I too have classes. I too have to wake up early in the morning to attend classes. But at the same time, they, they come to me, uh, can you please help me set up this? Because they, they are not uh, exposed or known to, you know, using Google Me, using uh, Microsoft Teams, all these uh, applications and luckily, I was born in the era where you know technology is now being used, so I know how to use all these um, applications. So I have to help them in that uh, area. So uh, relating to my point, uh, as a student and as a sister, uh, the challenge, my challenges during the pandemic is I have low motivation to basically do anything, uh, to learn, to do better, to improve myself. Because dealing with multiple and mixed roles at home does contribute to my uh, low motivation. So as I said, like for example, being a sister and a daughter and a student all at once is mentally draining because we have to like rush between uh, getting house chores done, helping my siblings, and then also getting my tasks, my assignments done on time. Because like Abida mentioned, uh, 
we have you know we have that range of time eight to six but we don't only attend class between eight to six we also have to get our tutorials done our work done within that time because uh when we attend class physically we just attend class and then we go back to our rooms and get our tutorials done we don't necessarily have to you know do everything all at once so that results in having a very hectic daily schedule and um, you know that will uh, result in multitasking you know unnecessary multitasking having to cook while attending class so you don't really have you know a clear focus you don't I don't have a clear focus because I don't really I'm not like 100% in my class um, so that eventually results in insufficient or inefficient learning or not optimum learning for me and at the same time uh, we know that not everyone is privileged enough to live in a home with you know many rooms that can accommodate uh, our students our, our needs it's luckily as for me i am privileged enough to have uh, to live with my parents who own a double story house we have many rooms so uh, i although i share my room with my sister we have certain areas of the room that we can you know conduct our own uh, learning sessions so she can have her class going on and i have my class going on without interrupting one another but some of my friends uh, from the people that i know they struggle with this issue they have to share the, uh, their rooms and they don't, they don't have areas that they can uh, uh, conduct their classes and this in a way disrupts their learning process because uh, they have to take turns some even have to miss out on class because they have to give in to their younger siblings or uh, uh, older siblings so um, yeah not all of us are privileged enough to you know have our own spaces to learn and then uh, that's also a, a struggle, a challenge during the pandemic because uh, in Malaysia, uh, we had a phase where everyone had to stay home and none of us had, could go out. I think, yeah, no, not, none of us. So basically everyone, the whole family is at home and we have to adapt and try and you know, give and take, not only among siblings, but also among parents. You know? Like my, my parents, they, my dad has to work in the kitchen, my mom has to go in the room. So. It's like everywhere everyone is everywhere at home uh, and also uh, as we all know our bedroom is also known as a, you know a space for us to feel safe and relax before the, the pandemic began but now that uh, learning itself and for teachers teaching as well takes place in our room we share that safe place uh, with you know spending time doing our work our assignments so uh, as students uh, who is like uh, Dr. Sofian said, we are slowly transitioning, right? So as students who are slowly transitioning uh, transitioning and trying to adapt to the changes, we don't often get to uh, get used to the changes that quickly. Uh, so uh, we don't get to break that barrier in our head. We have that, that, that range of time to prepare ourselves, just like Dr. Sofian said. Uh, that even though it's probably like five minutes, that five minutes is enough for us to be mentally prepared for this class and then we have to walk to another class that, that that time two minutes three minutes is enough to prepare ourselves and restart and, or reset so uh, this this issue is uh, a challenge for me as a student as a daughter and as a sister because i end up jumbling up my emotions my task and i uh, you know, I end up struggling in managing my time. So that eventually, at the end of the day, it <clears throat> decreases my motivation to learn and do better, to excel. And yeah, just like Alida said, over time, uh, us as students, we feel exhausted and burnt out. And that also, in a way, uh, affects our work, our quality of work. So I think that's all for me. Um, I mean, can I add on several something? Okay, so like it's interesting. Like when you mentioned about you are you being the elder sisters that you have to help your siblings. Even though I'm the youngest daughter, I have a little brother. So at home, when they are he is having like trouble, especially with subjects that are not like mathematics. Seeing that I'm the old 
the closest age to him. So I would, my family assumed that I would know how to teach him, especially when it comes to mathematics or anything. But the thing is, I, well, there's a reason why I'm taking Tassel. I'm <laughs> Tassel here. So when, when I, am un, I am unable to help him and also unable to fulfill my tasks, other tasks as a daughter, like sometimes with my parents asking me like to do other works, especially when I'm in class during classes and I would have to say that, okay, I would do it later, but sometimes I kind of forgot or didn't do it. So they had to do it anyway. It kind of have like strained my relationship with them. It makes like, they feel like they are frustrated with us with because they feel like we are not understanding them. We don't understand them. But at the same time, we are feeling exactly the same thing. So sometimes it feels like um, it's strange relationship to the point, not, not like that bad, but you know, like you know that I feel the frustrations from my parents. I feel the frustration that for my siblings that I couldn't help them. So it feels like, yeah, and when that happened, it spoils our emotions. Yeah, that spoils our mood and then we feel like, oh, I don't, it feels like we emotional, emotional health decreases and to the point that, yes, as Ayan has mentioned, it causes me to have no motivation to study because I feel like, okay, my surrounding is so negative right now. So I feel like um, just being whatever what I want to do, I have no motivations anymore. Thanks. Um, can I add a little bit? Um, so what, um, what, what COVID has done, um, in fact, is has created uh, affordances. Affordances in, in, in the ways that we do things um, and the use of technology within the uh, educational spaces um, but it also has impacted on how we live our lives and the roles and obligations that we have uh, within the society and within our families uh, one of the more uh, bigger discussions in academia in terms of um, the teaching and learning spaces is this need for us to be compassionate to one another compassionate in a sense where it actually has a it actually has a framework and it's called compassionate pedagogy um, as much as it is currently used in higher education it is still applicable to all across all levels of um, education compassionate pedagogy essentially uh, uh, how do i say promotes this idea that we treat each other well we th we think we do right we think we do and we we want to know that we do things well and we do things in other people um with other people's uh in in consideration of other people's uh how do i say emotional well-being but because we are we are currently in in a situation where we have our own stresses and we have to do things but at the same time also as teachers or as facilitators of learning we also have that duty of care to our students right so there is this how do i say co-dependency in terms of how students and teachers treat one another so it's called uh compassionate pedagogy one of the things that you can do as a teacher is you understand that you have stresses but you also have to be aware that your students have stresses, right? You are aware that you don't, your, your time is quite limited, right? You also have to understand that your students' time is also quite limited. You understand that you have obligations at home. You also need to understand that your students may have obligations at home. So everyone is working around stresses and everyone needs to be kind to one another. So one of the things that we do at uh, Griffith University at this particular time, and we have started quite, um, I think a year back, understanding that our students are human beings and, and, and they have, they need to take care of their own mental uh, health well-being and, and we need to support that accordingly. So in terms of assessment items, um, you know, assessment items, we usually have a deadline. All right. We understand that some of our students may not be able to meet that deadline and we acknowledge that it could be due to their own stresses that they need to manage. So instead of saying no, you have to submit on time. OK, we encourage them to come to us and say and, and, and advise us why they are not able to submit on time. There's also a lot of flexibility in terms of the expectations that students come to this online space. 
because sometimes students don't want to be in the presence of others, regardless whether it is face to face or is it online. So we tell them, tell us if you need to have time off, tell us or tell us why you have not been present in that space, in the teaching and learning space. So this is what compassionate pedagogy is all about. The basic root of compassionate pedagogy is to essentially be empath empathic to whoever that you're speaking to, right? And I, I'll give this example whereby if I'm a teacher in a primary school and this student came, in, came up to me and said, Cikgu, saya belum buat homework. And then your reaction is, kenapa tak buat homework? Buat sekarang, you know? So that's not necessarily taking into consideration the, uh, the, 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 the child or the student's feelings or what, and acknowledging what they are experiencing at that time. So a better situation, a, a better response would be, uh, kenapa tak boleh buat homework? Uh, ada masalah ke kat rumah? Um, ataupun uh, nanti lepas sekolah kita boleh buat sama-sama. That kind of response, right? So again, being compassionate to each other is what we really need. Um, within the teaching and learning space and as, as teachers who are, who have duty of care to our students. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you, Doctor. You know, despite only, uh, this only being the first session of our discussion, we have learned uh, so much from uh, each of our panelists. Now, let's hear uh, Daniel's uh, thoughts on the kind of challenges that he has faced uh, during the uh, previous pandemic. Alida has spoken, uh, Aymin has spoken. So uh, actually, uh, mine also quite the same problem with them, uh, but it's only focused on communication boundary. So basically communication boundary between, uh, is my problem is on communication boundary between friends during online classes. So um, during pandemic, we have struggled to adapt uh, because we do not prepare for the transition uh, from physical classes to online classes. So uh, there will be a communication boundary, a communication problem between us as students. And I think as a teacher also, uh, we ha uh, do have uh, that kind of problem. So first of all, uh, what I can see, this uh, communication boundary can be caused by two uh, factors. The first one will be the geographical factors, uh, which is some of my friends live in a place where internet uh, connections is not so good. So this area uh, sometimes also affects the cellular, uh, cellular call, which give no option for the communication. Uh, the second one will be the time allocation, uh, because when at home, uh, uh, we are bound to other tasks such as uh, washing dishes, taking care of plants, um, our mother's plants, and other house uh, house chores. So uh, communication was uh, limited to a certain period of time. For example, late at night or after all the chores finish, which cannot be predicted if we are at home. So basically, uh, communication uh, during pandemic. Uh, also became a hassle for us as a students to do our task and complete uh, complete it as it should. So, uh, based on my experience uh, during online classes, I do have these kinds of problem with my friends. We have uh, to find our uh, we have to finish our tutorial late uh, at night, and sometimes we can't even slap just to finish all the work we have. Uh, we also have uh, cases like people have to go out of town or even climb to high places just to get an internet connection. Yes, I do deny that Malaysia's internet inf uh, infrastructure is developing, but it cannot fulfill the demand in the current time where people are moving to the internet to study. Because uh, when a pandemic strikes us, uh, we can see that all of sectors uh, from the health sectors, uh, education sectors, politics, all turn to internet for uh, the connection uh, when they are trying to connect with other people. So, um, Malay uh, Malaysia is not prepared for this uh, uh, for this struggle. So, uh, 
uh, education sector, uh, sector impact is very hard and we as the students uh, experience it firsthand. Uh, as uh, we are in campus, we also have our online classes on campus. Uh, before uh, on during pandemic, we also came back to campus and we have online uh, classes, our online classes at campus, which also did not help us to attend our classes properly because of the geography uh, geographical factors of our campus in the hillside, which uh, sometimes the internet can be very slow. There will be a downtime, so uh, this uh, communication boundary uh, give us a space that. Uh, make us struggle to study and make it become uh, studying is like a uh, chores. It's not like uh, our, uh, it's become like a very heavy duty for us, for a student. So uh, I also uh, collect some uh, experience during my uh, school-based experience program uh, last month, like uh, Iskandar. So uh, during this, uh, SBE program. Uh, I have interviewed some of the students uh, what they have faced during the uh, pandemic era. So uh, where I go, where, where I went is in the uh, rural area school. So this school, these students uh, have missed, like it's kind of said in, uh, in my place or in my schools also, the students have missed about two and a half years because of the pandemic. So what I I, I have interviewed the, the year six uh, students and they uh, say that uh, when they are in year five and year four, they don't even understand uh, what uh, the teachers teach uh, in online classes. Basically, I uh, especially in English because I, English is uh, can be a foreign language, can be a second language, and even can be a fourth language in Malaysia. Uh, uh, what we call it? A Malaysia background. So, uh, these uh, students cannot learn English properly because of the pandemic uh, itself, because of the communication boundary uh, they have at home. They don't have that leverage uh, of connection to uh, attend online classes and sometimes their parents also cannot help, could not help them to understand English because some of uh, their parents do not even understand English well. So I think that's all from me. Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Daniel. I would like to touch upon the word privilege because I did mention the word privilege and I think COVID, despite it being uh, a hassle, a problem, but it has actually taught us to be more appreciative of the benefits that we have. You know, we are all we are very, we are very lucky to have access to all of the uh, benefits that we currently have, like internet connection, uh, devices to be wherever and whenever we want. <clears throat> but some of the people, you know, that has been affected with COVID, like the students that uh, we observe in school, uh, some of them they don't even have the ability to attend online classes. They were simply gone for like two and a half years, meaning they did not learn anything. And that would, uh, I mean, that has created a pretty wide, uh, I would say, uh, gap uh, in their education. Because there are some year six students who were not able to read. And some of them, they were not able, even able to write. It goes to show just how bad, uh, you know, COVID uh, has affected our, you know, sector uh, education. <clears throat> and yeah, I think like in some ways, uh, I was not highly, you know, like appreciative of the fact that, you know, I have all of these uh, things with me, but during COVID, uh, especially when, you know, I, I am attending classes, some of my uh, peers, they were not, uh, they were having trouble with connection issues. You know, I, we literally saw them getting in and out, getting in and out and trying to, trying as hard as they can to be in class, but it's a struggle, you know, especially for those who don't exactly have access to the right infrastructure as mentioned by Daniel. Uh, but you know, as discussed previously, you know, the current situation has greatly affected our education community. But despite all, we have persevered through the hard times and to be able to be where we are currently. Uh, therefore, I believe that the challenges that 
that were introduced by all of our panelists did come with their own set of you know approaches as with all the problems there would always be a uh, solution therefore i believe our fellow audiences would definitely want to know how or what are the approaches that our panelists have used to overcome these challenges now let us begin with uh, dr amalina You mean me, right? Yes, yes, Dr. Amalina. Yeah, yes. Okay. Dr. Amalina. Dr. Amalina. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so, um, so in terms of uh, uh, the solution to the challenges or approaches to overcome the challenges, um, so I, I would just like to share um, what the teachers at my children's school did, which was, uh, which was quite good, and I think I really commend their hard work um, and. They were actually really quick to adapt to the changes, uh, but I think they, they had a lot of support from the school itself, so from the principal and the admin and stuff. Um, so what they did was, um, uh, I'm just co commenting in terms of um, primary level because at that time they were all in primary. Uh, so for each level, all the teachers sort of got together and they um, they, they they compiled all the um, tasks and work that's needed and for the week and um, what worksheets and what activities needed to be done for that subject and so and so. Um, so they did that, they compiled everything uh, for that week. So they came up with um, like a schedule. So for example, for my my uh, son who was in uh, level three, uh, year three, um, they, uh, there's a schedule for the week. So Monday, uh, what he has to do for for the day for mathematics for lang uh, for english what he has to do um for pe what he has to do and then for tuesday wednesday and until friday so it's quite detailed that schedule so when you get it at the at the start of the week you sort of it's really helpful for the parents to know what's expected for the whole week and um for me i can sort of um uh, manage around you know what I can do every day so if I can't do this today um, I will do it tomorrow or if I, I feel like today is a better day to do maths I'll just do all the maths lesson for the week today so it was really quite helpful um, and um, uh, the other thing was they also considered um, the fact that not all parents uh, are able to access you know the internet or have printers to print out worksheets and uh, and um, the, their homework. Um, so that's why they came up with that learning package. So basically we were given um, a choice of either just sticking to uh, online resources. So they will just email the whole, you know, the whole pack for the week where you can download and you can either print or just work from your computer. Uh, or uh, you can go and grab the, um, the learning package for the week. So you go and drive into the school, it's a drive through process. You grab the package for your child for that week and all the everything's printed in there so it's like one big folder with um the schedule you know their worksheets what they need to do so um it was really helpful for those parents who don't you know don't have the ability to print out stuff and don't, don't have enough computers for all their kids um and as for me i did have i did have computers but i found it helpful to have everything in in um uh printed out yeah uh so that was really good um, and I think that really helped a lot. Um, and from my point of view, I think um, the amount of lessons that the, the teachers gave wasn't wasn't too bad. Maybe because they were still in primary and you know like in lower levels. Um, but I found that um, the the the, the um, tasks that they gave and the the lessons were um, were not too much. Like it was it was bearable for the kids. Um, so the what the teachers did was really helpful. So that's the support, um, yeah, support that was you know from the school from the teachers. Um, they also set up Microsoft Teams. Uh, so for like year, I think the the ones uh, the, my kids in year three and year five they had Microsoft Teams. So um, some of the lessons they can just uh, obtain from from Microsoft Teams, and um, so. I think in contrary to how uh, online learning is done in Malaysia, I think in Malaysia, most of the online learning is like the kids sitting in front of a laptop listening to yes, yes. a lesson after another, or one after another. Linear. Yeah, sorry? I think it's pretty, you know, like linear, like linear because it only happens, sometimes it feels as if it happens. 
Yeah, so um, whereas here, um, it's, it's, they don't really sit in front of the computer much. Um, so they do the, all, all the lessons that were, that were given in that, you know, that, that for the week. Um, and then their teachers just set like um, meetings, for example, it really depends on the teacher, but most teachers, they do like, okay, and half an hour meet up in the morning at 8.30. So they just say, make sure everyone, all the kids come in front of the computer on Microsoft Teams, join the meeting. And then what the teacher does is, what the teacher did was um, just find out from, you know, from them, okay, do you have any problems, any of your lessons? Do you have any questions? Uh, make sure you're doing this and that. So it was really a brief sort of, you know, catch up in the mornings for the teachers to, to, to make sure that, okay, the kids have woken up and they are ready for learning. Um, and just to take their um, attendance as well. So, um, so, it, um, so it wasn't too much of, you know, like looking at the screen all day. Um, so um, the, the lessons that they gave were quite uh, variable. So, um, so one of the things with, I guess, with Australian style of uh, learning is very different from Malaysia, I find. Um, because I think in Malaysia, it's a lot of like reading, memorizing, doing homework. So, it, you know, the same cycle, textbook, reading, homework, and then give it, you know, ask the teacher to mark and get your, you know, your score. <laughs> but whereas here, uh, the learning is very variable. So um, not everything is on paper. Not everything is, you know, a worksheet that you have to do. So for example, um, if it's a mathematics lesson about uh, division, so the, uh, uh, like um, coins or something like that, and then try to, you know, um, divide this, um, for four people. So how do you divide, you know, these objects for four people, for example? Um, and then I can't remember exactly, you know, uh, uh, what they did, but that was one of the examples. So what I did was I got all my kids involved, even though that, you know, that activity was only for one child. So um, I got all my kids involved. So I, I called all of them, okay, come, let's go, come and do this together. Because because I wasn't coping anyway. So <laughs> I just get them to do this so that they're all in one activity. Um, so um, they all got involved, you know, um, you know, I just uh, explained it to them, you know, differently. So if it's for my prep uh, son, then I'll just say, you know, this is how you divide things equally. And then for my year three, then I will, you know, explain it uh, in more detail. Um, but yeah, it was quite, um, it was, uh, uh, yeah, interesting because um, uh, it wasn't, there were a lot of like um, active sort of learning as well. Um, and uh, sometimes they have to collect things from outside the house, and so yeah, it was quite yeah interesting. Um, uh, and like for and another example is um, for my prep child. Uh, prep is like I don't know whether you know, but prep is uh, the year before year one. So kids who are so it's like a preschool, five, I think. Pretty little, um, like like preschool, yes, like kindy. Um, so. One of the like one of the tasks that they need to do was uh, sing a nursery rhyme and then you know um, uh, uh, do a puppet show or the nursery rhyme or something like that. So I got all my kids involved. So I so I told them, okay, you all you know dance with this nursery rhyme. I'll take a video and send it to your teacher. So they all got involved. So you know it was quite fun. So I think as a parent, you know, um, you know, one of the ways to cope is you know to just make it fun and flexible and. Um, yeah, make it make it more in, in you know involve all the kids all at the same time. Um, the teachers also gave a lot of resources, so like you know watching YouTube vi YouTube videos. So for things that are more complex, like you know grammatical things, which even I don't understand <laughs> in English lessons, they give like YouTube uh, videos and like a link that your child can watch, and then you know it just explains what it is. So um, that was helpful as well. Um, and uh yeah the other thing is i guess when you're managing kids um um at different levels and um uh different needs uh i think it's important to lower expectations as well so as a parent um to not you know put such a high expectation that your child will finish all the lessons you know that was given on that day not to be so cranky or angry if they're like kenapa tak buat semua ni cikgu bagi kan uh, so macam uh, apa you <laughs> You sort of have to uh, transition from the Asian parenting sort of style to a more, you know, like compassionate, you know, like like uh, Dr. Sofian said, you know, being more compassionate and understanding towards them as well because they're also adapting um, and also uh, giving them lots of rewards. So rewards at the end of the day, okay, we can go to the park, you can play on your scooter, um, 
we, we were still allowed to go to the park at the time, so it was good. Uh, we could go out, you know, short breaks and things like that. Um, so yeah, so yeah, uh, I think in a nutshell, it's it's quite important, I guess, um, as a parent to be flexible and um, uh, be understanding towards your kids needs and you know they're also stressed you know we have to understand that um and at the same time i think um the constant support and um resources given by the school and the teachers were really helpful yeah. uh, yes uh, thank you uh doctor um when you i when you mentioned something about the you know differences between malaysia and australia in terms of education i believe the biggest differences is in the teaching methodology because I, I think in, in Australia uh, you guys would be um, you know when it comes to the lesson uh, the lesson would be uh, implemented alongside a contextual learning strategy whereas in Malaysia uh, there have been you know uh, you know uh, the efforts to actually try to implement that as much as possible but due to you know the infrastructure and support from parents it's very difficult for teachers to actually do that and it's even more difficult because uh, the generation of teachers that we currently have right now, they are really struggling with, you know, like technology and all. You know, we are young teachers. Of course, we would uh, be, you know, energetic to learn all of these, uh, uh, you know, things about technology, you know, get to learn about creating games online and all. But for, uh, you know, like older teachers, they would struggle a lot. But one teacher, when I uh, was doing my second SBE, uh, he really uh, opened, not exactly my eyes, but inspired me because despite being, I think he's about 55 years old, he actually worked really hard. He, he created a game uh, using PowerPoint. And uh, as someone, you know, like uh, uh, you know, at that age, creating a game, he literally learned uh, everything about creating a game in PowerPoint. And it really inspired me because like, uh, sometimes even we as young teachers we tend to be like oh my god this is just too much work but then he you know he's like a teacher of the previous generation you know he tried his best to actually make learning as fun as possible for the uh, for the kids um, now i believe that all of us would be very curious to hear how dr sofian uh, you know his kind of solutions and approaches to the challenges that he has faced during the pandemic i think i'm gonna focus on the um the core business of uh, us as teachers. And in just that short, um, how do I say, um, spiel that Marlena did just now, there's a lot of pedagogical approaches that, that will be useful within the context of COVID-19 and how uh, our teachers in, 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 your, in your institution can learn from what the Australian context have done. One will be the learning packages, all right? And also the other one would be, how do you manage the, the remote learning time? And according to Marlena, it's more, more about the teachers checking in, right? And asking them how they're doing, do they have issues? It's not full on online teaching because students at that age in primary school, they cannot have that span of attention to look at the teacher online for two hours to teach them something. So what the teachers in Marlena's school did was that they understood their audience, they understood their students, and more importantly, they understood the parents and the obligations that, and the responsibilities that the parents have, had to do, uh, have to do at home at the same time as taking care of their children when there was a lockdown. Um, in the second lockdown in, in, in Brisbane, uh, my son's school, Marlena, they did this, a similar similar thing. So they check in in the morning for half an hour. So students all come in and then subsequently there'll be activities that, um, that are sent for that particular week and we do it at home as much as we can. And understanding that they do not want students to be just staring at the screen, there are activities like what you mentioned just now that students need, can go out and collect leaves. And then after that, they do art, artwork with it. You know, that kind, of, that kind of engagement. So the thing about remote learning, it, remote learning is not primarily online learning. That is what we need to know, right? Remote learning could mean anything. Remote learning can, you can get, you can help your mom in the kitchen and do measurements, all right? It's just that it is 
taken out of the classroom space. So I think one of the good messages from Marlena's description of her, her experiences during COVID-19 is this understanding that student engagement doesn't necessarily have to be just online, doesn't actually have to fit that uh, 45 minute period, all right? But more importantly, as teachers, we need to understand who our students are, okay? Things that they may or may not have, as you mentioned there just now, one is Kanda, and many of you have mentioned that some of your students do not have access to technology. So how do we mitigate that? Because we don't want these students to fall through the gaps and then we lose them, you know, and that's, we are not, do, not doing our duty. We have not done our duty of care. So understanding our students and under, who our students are, understanding the parents, the students' parents, will somewhat give us an idea of how to tweak our teaching approaches. How do we use content and things like that? Um, I do have to disagree a little bit with you, Wan Iskandar, when you say that there's a lot that there are clear distinctions in terms of how the Australian uh, um, teachers do things and how the Malaysian students, uh, Malaysian teachers do things. Because essentially, there are many different ways to teach but we need to understand our students and we need to understand our context, all right? Uh, the other thing that I also uh, gathered from uh, Marlena's description was this idea that, um, and this is core, and this is core to teaching, and it's always been a teaching philosophy of mine, is this idea of socialization, okay? If you leave the students to tend to them for themselves and you don't engage with them in whatever way, half an hour, 10 minutes, you lose that socialization uh, in ways of that you are saying, hey, I'm here. You don't need to teach them even. You just need to say that I'm here. How are you? That's the socialization part. You don't need to do a lot. Okay. When you create that socialization within your class, within you and your students, and different teachers do that in their own ways, all right, you create this sense of belonging. Now, sense of belongings is important, okay? Wherever you go, whatever you teach, however you teach, this sense of belonging is important. You need to feel that. You need to make your students feel that they belong in your class, in the school, in this big Malaysian education system. If they don't feel that they belong, you will lose them. So as much as we are saying that COVID-19 has presented us with challenges, we need to understand there are three, there are two core, core values or core approaches that we need to do, all right? That we need to make them feel belong and that we need to understand them. So these are the two core values, regardless of whatever challenges that we face. Um, the other thing that I need to share with you a little bit more would be this idea of online teaching. We need to understand that online teaching is different from face-to-face -face teaching right it is a special skill some people can teach on in an online space most teachers can't because why they don't have the skills all right and you build those skills over time and that's why i i kept emphasizing this idea of transition when you're told to do an on to do online teaching and you don't have time you quickly go into it without much planning but now you have an understanding and you build up that capacity in terms of how do I teach online? So you build up those skills. So over time, hopefully your online teaching will be better. Hopefully, right? Hopefully. But it is not a skill that all teachers have. It is an acquired skill, something that you learn, including how do we use content in an online space? Marlena was just saying, okay, um, let's do these grammatical exercises and then let's do homework and then I'm going to give you feedback on that homework. It doesn't necessarily work in the online space, right? In the online space, you probably will need to find ways in which how you actually show, okay? If you can't show in this online space, you need to give them an activity such that they can do elsewhere or at home. All right, homework sometimes doesn't actually work also in the online space simply because as what Marlena has also identified, I'm, an, I'm one of the guilty ones 
okay, where I don't submit, where I don't get my student, my children to do homework and submit. So how can then you mitigate that? Do they actually need to do homework? Well, I can't, I can't comment on the, Australian, on the Malaysian context whether there is this, uh, this, this, this practice of you have to do homework. But within the Australian context, homework is when you need additional practice. It is not something that you do because you have to do it. Marlena, am I, am I getting the concept right? I think, yeah. So it's not something that you have to do to show that you know things. But it's more about you do because you need a little bit more help in that particular area. And our homework is not massive. Our homework is quite targeted, right? If you can't do multiplication table, then a multiplication table eight or nine, I'm just going to let you do homework on that. I don't need you. I don't need you to go beyond that necessarily. It's more about capacity and, and, and knowledge development. So I know that a lot of you are talking about in terms of oh I'm I'm, I'm I am impacted by by the situation that I'm burnt out. That is real. That's the reality of it, right? That's the reality of it. But what we need to do is that we need to actually find time and look at our own processes and see how we can make it better. And also find time how we can get some time back for ourselves. And I think that's, and that will give you that motivation to say, hey, I am a teacher. I can, I'm doing great things in society. But I actually need that 30 minutes to go to Starbucks. I need that one hour to tengok wayang that kind of thing you need to try and get that space or else you're going like a energizer bunny you go on and on and on and on and on and then you burn out and then you feel that this is not necessarily a thing for you when in actual fact it is your calling so that's that's my my closure in terms of we challenges are there we need to try and find time for ourselves so that we can face these challenges to the best of our ability Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Doctor. Because then, at the end of the day, uh, you know, uh, the core of, I mean, the priority of our life should be to keep and maintain our both physical and mental health as much as possible. You know, we don't know how long this uh, situation, you know, will you know extend. You know, we for now we have COVID, but later we don't know what kind of. Mm. And make well, other happy. challenges that's right yeah. and if you can take care of yourselves you can definitely take care of your students that's that's my my thinking because the once you know how to to, to take care of yourself because at, at the end of the day we are all human and once you know how to take care of yourself of course definitely you will know how to take care of your uh, students you know, i like it when you uh, actually when you, you mentioned about uh, and also dr malina because when she mentioned about the you know the teacher giving care uh, learning packages and all, it reminds me of your uh, point about uh, compassionate pedagogy. And I was like, oh, I think that's related to it, you know, because the teacher understood the, the, the parent and the, the students. But it's something that in Malaysia we aspire and we are trying to do, but the reality is it, it is for now, it is still difficult, you know, because it requires a lot of support, not just from the parents, but also from the school the teachers and all. But then we are, you know, living in this uh, circle as a community. so. Uh, there's a need for a connection between all of us and once we actually establish a strong connection, I believe the Australians have managed to do that as seen by how the schools, uh, uh, for uh, Dr. Marina's schools uh, managed to, uh, I think, excellently create a pretty good learning environment because it's not only interactive for the students, but it provides them with something that they relate to, you know, they go outside, they get these and all. <clears throat> so that that is something we Malaysians are, you know, aspire to do. You know, we are trying to do, and I think that uh, me and my peers, uh, hopefully, will be able to actually implement that uh, as we work towards becoming a professional teacher soon. Uh, so, yeah, Doctor, do you want to say anything or something? Yes, um, and, and you're right. And I think um, a lot of times we are somewhat. We need to navigate the spaces where it is maybe an innovation that you want to, that you have learned from somewhere, you know, from somewhere that you want to apply. But we understand that we work within the constraints of um, culture, institution and things like that. But, but just saying that there are many different ways in which we can approach this idea of 
adaptive learning packages. For example, um, this is what I know from my, my uh, students, teachers, that they share those learning packages. Uh, for example, the whole level will do the same and then another teacher will do a differentiated one for uh, uh, students in that level who may have a different ability. So it's work that is shared across that level of teachers. So, so a leader don't just create her own resources or Aineen creates her own resources, but rather a leader create resource for the, the whole uh, level, say level three, and then Ainin will develop a differentiated learning package for level three for students who may need a little bit of help. That kind of, how do I say, collaborative, uh, um, how do I say, uh, collegial and collaborative practice is something that probably uh, will help. Uh, because as you mentioned, Ainin I and Alida, that you don't have that much time really. But if you work together, you can say, okay, can I just focus on this group? And then you focus on that group and then we can disseminate. So that's again thinking in a way how we can make how we can get that half an hour back. So rather than creating two resources, I mean creating two resources, I a leader creating two resources, you create one each. So again, but I also have to acknowledge that you need to sit down and think about planning, you know, which some of you may not necessarily have that space for. But if you do have space, this will be something that you'll be looking at. Yeah, yeah, it's very true, Doctor, because not only will it reduce our burden, but it will also provide time for us to uh, you know, maintain ourselves. Definitely. Uh, now, uh, let's move on to uh, Ms. Uh, Elida. Uh, what are the approaches that you have used to mitigate the issues that you have presented previously? Um, okay, um, so with uh, Dr. Sofian and Dr. Malina, they have both mentioned about the approach that is, well, we can see that it's mostly in the parents and educators' sides because, well, as a student myself, uh, the approach that I would have taken is, I it would, as students, it would be easy, it would be very much effective if we create our own kind of like schedule or routine in according to our learning styles. So like Dr. Marina has mentioned before, like her children are all different, they have all different learning styles, learning dates, uh, the curriculums are different. And as an individual, that's true because as a person, because we always see, I always see that like, people always say like, okay, if we want to do like have like an ideal schedule, we have to like wake up early, we have to do like from eight from the morning and do non-stop until the end. But I don't think that's like the ideal schedule works for everyone. It we have to actually know our learning style. Okay, for example, we know that there's like night owl and in the morning person and personally I am in the middle of it so <laughs> I can work sometimes I can work in the morning sometimes I can work in the end uh, like at night so when in terms of that I have come up with my own schedule like it doesn't have to I don't necessarily written it down like but I know that how my body works how my body device works especially my optimum time to work to study or anything so for example as myself I have learned that um, for example, uh, especially when I have like hectic schedule, like from 8 a.m. to like 5 p.m., I always have class non-stop. So at night, I will always sleep early, like um, around like 9 p.m. I slept already. And then I will wake up around like 3 a.m. and then to do my work. At that time, I feel that that's the best time for me in a sense of other people are asleep already. I am easily distracted by other things. So when people are asleep, I am able to study easier, so the internet connection is better like uh, in my campus well that's the time where people see so I have I get the internet connections in my room and stuff so when I do that when I have that kind of routine the family routine actually helps me so much for example like uh, Dr. Sofian has mentioned about finding space and time for ourselves so when I wake up like around three, I don't necessarily okay I just wake I didn't like wake I don't wake up and just like okay straight away do my work no I find the time like to do that me time or space, especially like, okay, I would go and like freshen up and then make coffee and make my coffee. At that time, I would like brace myself for the work that I'm doing to do. And then it takes time for me to like, okay, to collect my thoughts. And that was, I think that people actually used to usually overlook the fact that that kind of time, though it's like a very short time, short space, it's a very important Thing, but important thing for us, as, uh, especially because 
well, as humans, especially we're working or studying, we don't get that much. And that actually helps so much. And then, um, it, people always say that it has to be the schedule, it has to be healthy and balanced. What I feel like healthy and balanced in my sense, it would have to include me time. Okay, include me time. That me time, it has to be off screen. I cannot look at phone. I cannot look at my tab or my computer at all. Because one, I feel like it takes another amount. It's like a huge amount of energy just to look at computer. Because uh, as I mentioned, I am I have some kind of I don't really. I'm not really into technology, so I will really prefer like offline. When studying myself, I would really prefer with books or ev everything else. So I would do other things like me time, for example. Uh, it's important to mention like, my, sorry, like, for me, I have like, <laughs> I have like, um, I would read. I don't, the thing is, I don't read all that kind of like fiction, uh, non-fiction book. I feel like reading is my outlet. It's just like, okay, I read something for my enjoyment. So when I find that, I feel like it, it's a stress outlet for me. The same thing goes for physical activities. I would like, doesn't have necessarily, I would have to go running or go go jogging or anything. It would like, sometimes you just spend time but playing badminton or working out. That is enough for me, playing tennis because I have this kind, I've, physic, uh, I've undergone burnt out and I've had this kind of schedule and I felt the differences that it brings when we I have this kind of routine it brings it so much easier for me because um when I have like the proper outlet my stress sorry stress the proper stress outlet emotionally I feel like less less uh unnecessary overthinking like even though when I'm about to sleep before this when I am burnt out like when I am like stressed or everything I would be like oh my god even when I'm still resting, I have so many works to do. I've got this assignment, I've got this assignment. But I can't do anything because I'm not that kind of person that can function well when I'm tired. So I just keep overthinking. But when I have exercise, I have like do physical activities, my body has like, it tires easily. So my brain when I'm resting, it completely shut down. <laughs> so I won't be thinking, I'll be like, okay, I just have like proper sleep. I've got enough rest. I got less headaches and less outbursts. I feel like I'm most composed sometimes when we know like we just when we are frustrated, when we are emotionally stressed, we are easily to be like ticked off. Sometimes like even the smallest thing like really tick me off. I would be like uh, uh, get angry easily. But no, at this time with the schedules, it actually helps me better. And mentally, I would uh, like mentally and physically like mentally it's easier for me to get to understand lessons after that because I feel refreshed and everything and the schedule itself it doesn't have to be like as I, as I mentioned okay like in a table okay that 8 a.m. I have to do this no no it's in me it's like kind of journaling and one of the things other things I have also keep that help me to keep on track is when I like journal like keep on my schedule or routine I make like this kind of to-do list. Like, okay, I would say, okay, from above to the bottom, I will feel like when the, the urgent matters I have to tackle very soon, I will be put in red pen. So that, okay, I have to tackle this soon. I have to do this soon. So it really helped me prioritize my matters. And the list actually, even though sometimes when people say that, okay, even if I do like schedule or timetable, I don't necessarily follow them. But I don't exactly... Uh, believe that I disagree with that because I used to think like that or oh, like timetable it doesn't work much but when you have that kind of list to do list you subconsciously follow it it's like okay okay this is I have to do it doesn't it's not like something voluntarily but it's it's like you see and, and you see like okay I have to do this and it actually helps you tackle your problem and when that happens when I have to do list I have it helped me sort out my my thoughts because I have so many things to think it's like like so many things in my head sometimes with that when I tackle it it actually helps me like let's say I have tackled one of it like my my assignment like in which I usually very much procrastinate till the end of the to like okay like tomorrow to send I will procrastinate today but once I have like uh prioritize it beforehand I will feel like at that time I'll feel like okay when I finish it I'll, I will have this kind of sense of accomplishment and that 
when we tackle something, it's okay, I feel very positive. It boosts my positivity. I was like, okay, I'm just very happy right now. So when I do that, um, it helps me like overthink. Uh, it, sorry, it helps me avoid overthinking. Because I will, when I will be sleeping like, the next time, like that night, I, let's say I finish my work that night and then I will be sleeping, I will be not like, okay, I haven't done this work. But no, I won't be thinking about the animal because I know that I have tackled something and I will be tackling something in the future. So this technically, like very much uh, having this kind of routine improve health, especially when it comes to emotional and mental health. I think that's it for me. Uh, all right, uh, thank you, uh, Miss Ali. Now, I, I really like your point about, you know, stress uh, outlets. Even for me, you know, I have that, specific activity that I would usually do to uh, it's it's something that releases my stress but then at the same time it also provides me with the opportunity to organize the matters in my head you know because sometimes when uh, uh, you know with this whole online thing it's really hard for me to uh, organize about like uh, okay what I should do first okay what I should focus on but then I do that when for example when I'm working out you know as I'm lifting barbells and all it's uh, I, I would actually uh, work on uh, yes, these are the <laughs> that, that that time I would used to actually you know like uh, uh, prior like uh, uh, organize my uh, work into uh, okay what I should do first okay okay so this would be the thing that I would do after I work out or something and yeah it's very important because like you know I <clears throat> previously before the pandemic uh, I look at you know like stress outlets as something like uh, it's mad you know it, it's it's not really uh, something that's crucial but as the as the you know, as COVID happened, uh, it's I view it as something that oh man, if I don't have this, I'm gonna be blown out by uh, all of these you know classes and all you know. And that, I, I had actually uh, had a point uh, during the pandemic where I just feel like I want to punch and destroy everything. You know, I was just too burdened out by by all the things, the classes, the the work, the assignments, and all. It was like oh my god, it was too straining. It, it feels as if I have so many things. That I have to complete during the day, even though, uh, in, in you know, in actuality, uh, the things you know, there, there's time for me to do and focus on it all. And every doc doctor wants to say something. That's okay. Uh, yes, it's it's quite interesting how uh, Alida was um, describing the different ways in which uh, she. Um, how do I say, try to do activities to to take care of her own mental health well-being. Uh, it would be quite interesting to, we know that one is Kanda loves to go to the gym and work out to release stress. It would be quite interesting to ask the other panelists specifically what's their stress release. Um, for me, I do sewing. I use, go on to my sewing machine and I start sewing my sewing shirts. I have a pile of a fabric here that I know that I can use and then I start sewing um, shirts or, or whatever and that's my stress free activity. What's yours Marlena? Um, to be honest, I, I um, it's really hard for me with, <laughs> with four kids. <laughs> yeah, it's true, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I, uh, sometimes family time itself is stress relief for me. So like right. just us as a family going out somewhere and spending time and doing fun things is a stress reliever for me. Yeah. What about the rest? What's, what do you do to release stress? Yeah, yeah. How, how about you, Daniel? Uh, for me, I would do... Uh, actually, to organize, I love to walk in the evening. If you, uh, If Skanda knows me, I always... I will find time to walk in the evening. Actually, I don't love riding, so I will walk around campus. So when I walk, uh, I will think about uh, what I should do next, what I should do when I go back at, home, at, my, at my room. So at the same time, also can release my stress by looking at the nature, looking at my friends, Alida playing badminton. Yes, I saw her playing badminton. Sometimes I also play with her. So... <laughs> Uh, so these kind of, uh, of activities help me to organize my schedule actually. Yeah, uh, very true. And plus the views in our campus is pretty amazing, especially in the evening. You know, you can see the sunset and all the sky. It's so much, so beautiful. Yeah, even, though kind of, uh... not, even though the internet connection is not so good, <laughs> the view is good. 
<laughs> yeah, but the view is good. The view is good. Yeah. Okay, now uh, let's go to Ainin. And uh, what kind of uh, activity would you do to, you know, to mitigate the stress that you have to deal with the uh, as for me, because because uh, as I mentioned earlier, my challenges is more focused towards emotional drainage and all. So, uh, what I do to help myself uh, in terms of motivation is I paint. I'm not a good painter and I'm not an artist, but I paint aimlessly because knowing myself, uh, I am. I think I am a perfectionist in doing my work. I I would work in detail like i would have to make sure this is according to what i want to produce um because if it does not uh you know achieve what i want i will restart i will restart from the top all over again because i have experienced rewriting my essay three times because of that issue <laughs> so I find painting aimlessly, not 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 a picture, not a specific picture, painting aimlessly to be very, very comforting and therapeutic for me because um, yeah, I don't there's no expectation. I don't get evaluated, I'm not assessed. I am able to do whatever I like, draw whatever I like, paint whatever I like, even though it doesn't look like anything, <laughs> and use whatever colours I like. And yeah, I keep them all in one file and I get to see my progress, you know, uh, or maybe the first time I started painting, it was pretty ugly, but <laughs> as I progressed, although I'm not a good painter, at the same time, I'm not only, you know, um, releasing or de-stressing, I'm also uh, improving my artistic skills and that will also help in my teaching profession, right? So, yeah, knowing myself throughout this pandemic phase, uh, I think painting aimlessly is the best uh, approach that I have taken for myself, which helps me not only you know, uh, de-stress, but also uh, heal as a student. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's okay. You don't have to be good at art to be an artist. Okay, you know, art is subjective, so you don't have to worry about that. And yeah, I think uh, uh, something about art is, you know, it doesn't have to be, if you look at art as, you know, as an effort of trying to create something good, it would actually be another stress generator. Trust me, because when I draw and I want it to be as good as possible, it it, it only makes me even more mad at myself. You know, <laughs> even though art is a uh, is a form of therapy, uh, but then when I view it as you know, I just want to enjoy, just want to uh, experience, experiment with things, it becomes sort of like a playground. You know, it's as if I I become a kid again. And I just, you know, play around with whatever uh, resources that I have, you know. And that's something, you know, that's another interesting thing about art is that if you look at, you know, children, you know, you have to be like a child to truly uh, experience art as a therapy. If you are trying to, uh, you know, like view it as something like, okay, I want to, let's say, I want to draw a human, okay, I want to draw Dr. Sophia and I want to, to make a portrait of him, you know, to make it as good as him. Oh, it's going to be like uh, a stress. You, you will be stressed out by it. Trust me, you know, I experienced that I have went through that. And when you, when that happened, I would just, you know, like, you know I'm, I'm going to leave that behind. I'm going to go do something else. You know, I, I can't look at my art. Uh, same thing goes with our assignments, really, you know. Sometimes you just have to look away from it. And then after maybe like one hour or something, you look back at it and you're like, oh, I think I might just add this up and then it actually becomes good. So, yeah, I guess uh, all of us would have, you know, hopes for the... Uh, future of our education. We have heard how, uh, you know, so all of us manage uh, the challenges and the stress that came with all of these challenges. And I believe all of us would, uh, you know, want to share the hopes that we have for the future of education, especially uh, within the phase of, you know, the transition towards the uh, and end of the phase and hopefully the, we would just, and you know, COVID will no longer be around. So we'll begin with uh, Dr. Sofian. What are your hopes for the uh, future of our education? So my hopes in general for the future of education, and I think, um, and I'm going to respond to both in higher education, in kindergarten or whatever, um, doesn't really matter. This is a general hope that, um, that our students are taken care of, um, of their mental health well-being. Um, academics can take you to places, yes, definitely, but if our students are not healthy in terms of social and emotionally, they can't go places. 
So that is my biggest hope that we take care of our students. Thank you, Doctor. Now, how about uh, Ms. Adida? The hopes that you have for the future of our education. Okay. Uh, so, in the sense of my hope in the educational educational system, okay, it's in the sense of in Malaysia. I would hope seriously, uh, like it, we would have like equitable access to technology and infrastructure. But in the sense of that, we cannot actually let the technology overpower us or make them the slave of that of it. Sorry. So we have to take the advantage uh, to use whatever we have to use the technology in order to help with our teaching methods or with our learning. But in Asia, like because we know that as um Iskan when Iskandar has mentioned and even Daniel about all of us have one to SBE program and have like seen several different kind of uh, areas of schools. As myself, uh, I went to two different kind of school in the urban area and the rural area. And I can see like the, the vast difference between those two schools. And I hope especially in rural areas the, that they will have like better service like internet coverage so I have to help the students to be able to get as, mu as much as information as those in the urban area. Because I don't think that it's fair for them like to be compared just because to be compared of their knowledge of their proficiency level skills just because they don't have the exact material so in order to do say um we because just because like we are transitioning to enemy so i don't think like we we can like just push technology aside but we can actually take what we have learned during the pandemic like we see that technology helps us so we can make it like the school whether it's like higher educations or even like primary school or something that we can make the school like the learning environment to be hybrid uh, hybrid friendly whether they can like teacher can still teach face to face but they can include other like um uh, how would you say internet the technology for example like instead of like uh, writing on the whiteboard teaching about uh, let's say um adjectives we can yeah, show students about videos to them and you, they it will definitely help them because with the pictures with the visual with the music it makes the, uh, the learning and teaching sessions will be more interesting and it will be like um it would it supposed to be for me like we see this as hybrid friendly environment that and it, it's a code like how would I say this? It works both ways. It doesn't have to, we don't have to eliminate one thing just because to uh, take one uh, another. We can just use this as a codependency. We can use uh, at the same time to make it like even work better, or effic uh, more efficiently. Is it uh, yes, yes. Um, thank you, uh, Miss Alida. And uh, now, how about Miss Ainin? Your hopes for the uh, future of our education? Uh my hopes for the future of our education in transition towards the endemic phase is that I hope that uh, like certain uh, institutions or like for example non-governmental uh, organizations or even governmental organizations, even schools should provide programs or courses for both students and teachers for them to learn more about technology because now that we are in the endemic phase we never know when we are going to go back mm. or perhaps you know maybe in the future maybe not covid maybe another set of you know, pandemic for another um break or outbreak we never know so we have to always be prepared this is take this as a lesson i think i think we should take this as a lesson to be more prepared to whatever if that's going to come in the future and we know that no matter what we are going to be dependent on technology because technology has will and has evolved and it will be one of the things that we will have to depend on in the future so um, having programs courses you know for students and teachers not only teachers but also students is to prepare them for any possible changes for them to acquire these technology skills because you don't learn these skills in schools you don't have you have ict subject but you don't specifically learn about this uh application this uh, you know uh, coding and whatever sort that that helps you learn better teach better online 
So I, I'll, I'll give you an example, like what our institution previously, I think just recently conducted STEM program, which is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics program. So in this program, I uh, one of my friends um, participated in this program, and she learned a lot about coding, and I find that very, very inspiring. She, she learned a lot about technology and how to incorporate that in her lesson. So when I take a look at her lesson plan, when I look at how she creates her activities, it's really, really interesting. So I find that this, this programs, these courses should be implemented and organized in schools, in, uh, by, by any organizations that uh, whether direct or, or directly or indirectly associated with education. Uh, so yeah, I think that is my hopes for our education system. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Ainin. Now, let's go to Dr. Marlina. What are the hopes that you have for the future of our education? Or maybe as a parent, or maybe as a parent. Um, so, uh, for the future of education, I think um, I completely agree with Dr. So what Dr. Sufian said about, um, you know, placing an importance about the emotional well-being of the students. Um, so, I think that's, you know, um, uh, really important for the educators to understand what's happened in the past two years and how it's affected the students in terms of their emotions, their stress levels. Um, so, I think uh, there should be more support and encourage encouragement rather than um, punishments and threats so um i guess traditionally you know like um uh in general in malaysia there's a lot of you know um punishments for not completing your work and um you know uh threats being used and a lot of more negative sort of reinforcement um but i think we should move towards more positive reinforcements and more understanding and comp and compassion towards the students um the other thing is understanding that I think the curriculum um, should also be adapted to what's happened, um, you know, uh, given that many students might have been left out in the past two years, you know, they have missed out on probably a lot, you know, if they don't have access to internet and things like that. So um, I think the curriculum should be also adapted to, um, to acknowledge that, you know, um, uh, some students might need more attention, um, they might need to go back to their lessons and repeat it again before, you know, advancing to their levels um, uh, um, lessons. So um, that's another thing, I guess, to consider. Um, and lastly, I think um, based on what's happened during the pandemic, I think um, we've used a lot of online resources, you know, YouTube videos um, and things like that for um, teaching. So I think it's, uh, it's actually good experience and lesson for the future, whereas you know, instead of using um, uh, using uh, heavy textbooks, you know, kids having to bring big heavy bags every day to school and having to do their homework in these thick books, they can actually just use worksheets, print out from the internet, you know, just look at video when they go home. So, um, yeah, those things we can actually learn and bring forward so that we can actually make improvements to you know, our, our education style. Yeah, so that's, yeah, that's for me. Uh, thank you very much, Doctor. Now, finally, let's go to Mr. Daniel. Your hopes for the future of our education? So, uh, my hope for the future education, this uh, speci uh, specifically in Malaysia, is uh, first of all, I would love that Malaysia's uh, education system to be more uh, dynamic and not only centered and aim for the uh, highest point in education of the world. So I hope that Malaysia's uh, education system more uh, specifically uh, focus on the human being itself. Like Australian, I think I really inspired by the Australian uh, education system because rather than learn uh, for the exam or know the thing what they have learned, uh, the uh, ed uh, Australian education system uh, teach the student to survive, to survive the world and implement that what they have learned in their life. That's the thing that all of us as a teachers want uh, to teach our students because on and all, uh, we cannot teach them until they die. <laughs> That's the thing. So we want to teach them 
how to survive in this world. Even uh, uh, we as an English state, a tester, as a students, we are going to teach the student English. So how are we going to uh, make the education system provide the opportunity for these students, for these kids to learn English, to survive the world, to embrace themselves in this world? And one more thing is in terms of the communication uh, in uh, Malaysia's education, because communication is very, very uh, uh, important in education. Because if we miss something, it will <laughs> affect the whole generation uh, because of the miscommunication we have done. So um, the internet, the uh, how we give the uh, materials uh, to the students is very important to make sure that the message is uh, understandable and directly uh, affect the students so they can um, implement it in their life. I think that's all for me. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Daniel. I guess to sum it up, COVID is uh, you know, a hard lesson for all of us, but it is also an opportunity actually. You know, we get to uh, see how dynamic education actually is. You know, previously we would depend on, we would be too dependent on things like books, uh, physical worksheets and all, but now we know that there are many ways for us to, for us to you know, transfer information to our students. And it's not just about memorization, you know, trying to get through to be excellent in exams. It's also about, you know, survivability, you know. We want to uh, teach our students to be able to survive the, the current, uh, you know, condition of the world. We know that we are currently living in a very competitive world. And sometimes it, it's, it's going to be very difficult for, uh, you know, the future generations to simply survive through memorizations of instructions. Because now we want them to be critical and creative and all. So, as mentioned by uh, Dr. Sofian you know, throughout the discussion, as teachers, we should never lose the core value or the principle of our education uh, or profession, uh, which is to uh, support and provide as much as we can through any means necessary for the core of our, the core of our business, which is the students. And you know, we should always try to look at it, uh, uh, to look at anything positively, and of course, we would fly above and beyond and progress further as a community. So I would like to say again, thank you to Mr. Daniel. And I would also like to thank everyone for having the time to uh, participate in today's dis uh, discussion. And indeed, it was a thoughtful and fruitful discussion. I believe everyone truly enjoyed uh, you know, the sharing session that all panelists uh, had uh, you know, induced and shared. And uh, I think each panelist has managed to sh uh, actually share the, the experience and views on the topic of our discussion, uh, mainly the three things, the challenges, approaches to overcome challenges, and also hopes for the uh, future of our educational community. Now, despite the difficulties that we have faced throughout the process in organizing this webinar, we have persevered, just like how we did to survive the transitioning phase caused by uh, COVID. Now, nevertheless, it is with a heavy heart for me to announce that our webinar has finally come to an end. Uh, thank you to our esteemed international panelists, Dr. Sofian and Dr. Marlina, for having the time to be present and active in sharing their thoughts and experiences with us. Uh, furthermore, I would also like to thank our honorable representatives from IPG KPT, uh, Ms. Alida, Ms. Ainin, and Mr. Daniel. And hopefully a similar webinar could be organized again in the future. And I would also like to remind our audiences and participants to fill in the attendance form that will be attached in the chat. So again, thank you very much, everyone, and have a good day. Thank you. Terima kasih. Jumpa lagi. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 B